a video. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Oxygen for the Soul. This week's Pasha is Pasha Yitro. And uh, we are continuing um, in this uh, journey of the book of Exodus, the book of Shemot. The Jewish people finally are freed, and they leave the land of Egypt. They split the sea, and they see the miraculousness of God and his control over nature. And they are finally now in the desert, and they've had their man. They were attacked by the Amalekites. They overcome that. And now Parsha begins with Yitro, who was a uh, father-in-law of Moses, who was a priest of Midian. The Midrash tells us that he was a priest for all the religions. He was someone that was a, a very well respected. He was one of the three major advisors to Pharaoh in Egypt. There was, uh, it was Bal- uh, Balak, it was um, um, Yitro, and Eov. Eov uh, B- B- uh, Yitro is the one that ran away, and uh, it's his daughter. Uh, Tzipora that ends up marrying Moshe. Uh, the um, Maharal asks the question, he says, well, why is it that Moshe, who is this, comes from this great lineage of amazing people, uh, you know, Amram and Yocheved and the sister Miriam and Aharon, these are all amazing people, why, does it, why is it Moshe ends up marrying a, prince, a, a, a woman who's not Jewish? And the Maharal basically says that every neshama is equal to Moshe because he's our teacher. And therefore, specifically on a spiritual level, Moshe had to marry someone outside of the community. Um, and that was uh, who uh, Tzipora was. She was this uh, spiritual giant that came from the outside, and that's, that's why he was able to marry her, because he has to marry an Ezer Konegdo. Um, and uh, yeah, that is the story that I do not want to speak about today. I do not want to speak about uh, Yitro and uh, his family. What I really want to speak to you a little bit about is this idea of, of uh, what happens at the end of the parsha. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, last week's parsha ends with Amalek. This week's parsha begins with Yitro, and he's coming to go through conversion. You would think that after an attack like Amalek, that there would be Jews that want to leave their Judaism. Oh, here they hate us already. It's starting. You know, this is what this is this is what it's going to mean to be a Jew. That people are going to come after us. But instead, you see Yitro comes along, and he says, "I'm going to convert." And not only that, in his parsha, what do you see? The Torah is actually given in his parsha. So the Chachamim point out that there's two things that happen after Amalek attacks us. Number one is that there are more people that come to convert, and number two is more Torah is being taught. You see this again expressing itself where? In the month of Adar, with the holiday of Purim. They tried to attack us. The the Pasuk says that that their non-Jews were so overwhelmed by the the Jewish ability to to defend themselves that there were were non-Jews that started converting after the Purim story into Judaism. And as a result of that conversion, you had more and more Torah being uh, expressed. So people don't want to take us away from our connection to God and Judaism has an opposite effect. You have a opposite effect. The opposite effect is that what happens is that people now, as a result of this attack, want to be more and more involved in Torah and its mitzvot. Okay, so Yitro comes along and uh, he wants to speak to Moshe, gives him advice. Let's fast forward a little bit. Okay, the Torah tells us that as they were getting closer and closer and closer to this moment in time where they could actually uh, you know, uh, get to what I would say is the pinnacle or the particular peak, the point of creation, right? Um, in order for that to happen, the Jewish people had to move themselves into a place where they were achieving this level of unity, this idea that they were able to uh, move themselves into a place of Vayichen uh, Sham, and they encamped there, Keishachad, Belevachad, with one, one, one individual soul, one heart, one body, one mind, one heart. Now, what ends up happening is like this Moshe says to the Jewish people, You've reached this high level. In order for you to maintain this level, you've got to do certain things. Okay? You have to separate yourselves for a few days. You know, you have to prepare yourselves because the mission of the Jewish people is for you to reach a place of not just unity, but he says, he says, you saw, you witnessed what God did to the Egyptians. And God took you out on the wings of eagles. He brought you here to him. Now, if you listen and you're actually able to fulfill, if you're able to actually uphold and keep what God wants from each of you, right? Um, you're going to be for me. You're, you're, what, what you're going to each accomplish, okay, is you're going to be a treasured possession to God from all the peoples on the earth. 
You're going to have the special uh, status. Va'atem to you, mamlechet koanim. And to me, you will all be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, the Goy Kadosh. And these are the things you've got to tell the B'nai Israel. And Ma'am Moshe comes down and he stands before the Jewish people and he commands them to all these things. They have to separate for three days, they've got to wash their clothing, go to the mikvah. No, they're preparing themselves for Matan Torah. Now, this is it. God speaks in the beginning of Genesis. We hear him for the first time. And the next time you hear God addressing everyone, the audience, not just an individual, up until the, the, the Reshit, God is talking to individuals. But this is the first time where he's going to come down and speak to the all, all of the people. And God's, Moshe is telling God, God is telling Moshe that the Jewish people have to prepare for holiness. You guys have to be holy. Wash your clothing. Uh, you know, prepare for three days, and in this three-day period, at the end of it, you're going to have this powerful revelation like none other before. Okay? Uh, Pasu continues, and it says you're going to set borders, don't go up the mountain, don't touch the mountain. If you do, you'll be put to death. There has to be boundaries in order to receive some kind of holiness. Okay? Uh, and then it keeps going. It says, Moshe min ha'ar. Moshe comes out from the mountain, they did exactly what was told to them. They prepared for three days. They didn't touch any women. There was no intimacy during those three days in preparation for this moment. Complete meditation, focus on this most ultimate expression of clarity. And it says, And it was on the third day. Okay? Okay, there was three days on the third day. This day had three days of preparation. Okay, that would be the third of Sivan. And now three days later is the sixth of Sivan. There are these, the third, right over here, three days from then, you have what? You have these kol shofar chazak ma'od. You have thunder, lightning, a heavy cloud on the mountain, the sound of a horn very strong, and the people in the camp tremble. V'chared kol ha'am ha'shev They're all freaking out. They're like, this is the most overwhelming, powerful light and sand show you've ever seen. And then Moshe comes down, brings the people out before God and on the bottom of the mountain. Bahar Sinai Ashan Kulo. Imagine the mountain is rumbling and there's smoke coming out, right? Be'esh with fire. V'yal Oshno Ke'eshen Hakivshan V'yechid Kol Ha'har Ma'od. Okay? There was a, the smoke went up like smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain trembled greatly. It was like an earthquake happening. Ve'yi Kol Shofar Holech V'chazek Ma'od. And there was this, the sound of this, this, uh, very powerful blast of a shofar getting stronger and stronger, and Moshe would speak, and Hashem would reply with a voice. Okay? God comes down, and Moshe comes up. Go down, warn the people, lest they break through. There's got to be boundaries, because they want to see. They want to see who I am. Don't let them come up and see. Even the Kohanim can't come up and see. Hashem, don't worry about it. We've set up boundaries. It's all good. And then finally, this moment comes where God speaks. He comes down. God, he comes down. And what happens? What does he say? He says, This is what God says. I am God. And at that moment, everything stops. Okay, finally. Okay, you see a universe of... Uh, perfection, you see a universe of design, you see a universe of greatness, and right before that moment where God is literally ripping away the veil of reality, okay, there's a moment of silence. And the Midrash points this out to us very, very beautifully. Midrash tells us that when the Jewish people were ready at that moment, that there was a, there was a pause, okay, at that moment it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Okay, Matan Torah, there's a brief moment before God spoke where it was so quiet where everything just stopped. And this is the Midrash. The Midrash says that when God gave the Torah, no bird made a tweet. Okay, no fowl, no bird flew. No ox made any kind of sound. The, uh, there, no, 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 uh, no angel saying, you know, Kadosh, Kadosh. The sea did not roar. There was a complete moment of breathless silence where no voice went Forth. And then God said, Anochi Hashem Elokecha. Complete silence. Right? And this is a powerful idea. 
you know, it says there, there, are, there are psychological reports that say that people are so uncomfortable being alone, they need to have the radio on in the car. They need to have something playing in the background. We're so afraid of, of being by ourselves, but yet there is a precursor that if you want to be able to receive something as meaningful as God's word, there has to be silence, right? And you see this, by the way, the, 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 uh, the uh, Midrash continues, and it says that God spoke all these things, that they, he spoke with a great voice, Right? Rabbi Shimon said, what is the meaning that, it, that, that the voice stopped? He says, when a man calls his friend, there is an echo into his voice, but there was no echo in the voice that proceeded from God, meaning when God spoke, you'd think there would be this thunderous sound, like, Anochi, 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 and there was that. It was a complete, clear voice with zero echo. God does not need to echo. There was no echo from God, right? When, when, when the prophet Elijah, Eliyahu Navi, came down and he gathered all the people because he was trying to fight off the, uh, the Avodah Zarah of Baal, right, the idol worshippers of Baal, he was looking out to God and he says, what should I do? How do I stop this? And God comes down and he gives him a whole entire Musr Shmuz. He gives him a whole entire rebuke. And he says, what, that what? He says that God, when he came down, he said, God is found in, not in the storm, not in the thunder, not in the lightning, but where? He is found in the silent whisper. He is found in the, the sound of silence. That's where you find God. God is not found in the big places. Now, this is important. The Jewish people, they saw all these wondrous things happening from them, okay? And then all of a sudden, everything comes to a stop. Three days of preparation, meditation, internalizing what they're about to experience. The place where this was given, right? The midbar, not an accident. The word midbar comes from the word middaber, to speak. But it's also a place of silence. Who's speaking in the midbar? No one. Sometimes we need to move ourselves into a place of silence so we get the clarity we need to uh, understand, to internalize, to walk away with a little bit more depth. There was a um, a uh, uh, famous uh, French philosopher Pascal, right, who said that all of humanity's problems stem from a person's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Right? I can't do it. I, I just like we don't know how to sit still anymore. We see these our children always sitting in front of a screen, always consuming. This is bad. What happened to the ability of sitting and being alone and pondering and thinking? There's a famous story that is told of the Chose Melublin, who was a Hasidic master in the 18th century. And he would often go off into the woods by himself. And um, he would, um, you know, and, uh, you know, someone, his, 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 a father once asked him, a concerned father, said, why are you going to the woods alone? It's dangerous. What are you doing in there? So he says to this father, I go into the woods because I am going to find God. The father says back to the rabbi, you're going to the woods to find God? Don't you know that God is the same everywhere? It doesn't matter if you're in the, at home in the village. Why do you got to go to the village, to the forest alone to find God? So the rabbi responds, it's true, God is the same everywhere, but I'm not the same everywhere. I'm distracted. God doesn't change. I need to create change within myself. Okay, this is, I believe, what God is teaching us in this week's parasha. That what? That we need to find moments in time where we could pull ourselves away from uh, the, uh, the craziness of life. There is a uh, famous story that is told of, uh, of Rav Avram Isaac Cook who was forced to appear by a royal commission. And the commission was convened to discuss why the Jews insisted on praying at the Temple Mount, by the temple that was destroyed. Why do you want to go to the Temple Mount? Why do you got to go up there? Okay, so uh, the, uh, the, this, uh, this commission, Ur, who was overseeing this proceeding, said, you know, what's the point? Like, you know, why are you going there? Like, aren't you praying uh, on, on top of a bunch of, 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 of rocks that are, that are tumbled on top of each other? Like, wh why do you want to pray there? So Rav Cook said that just as there are hearts which are made of stone, so too there are stones which are made of heart. Right? We sometimes have to go to our, a broken place that reminds us of, of the destruction, of the brokenness of the planet, where we can go ahead and connect on God, to God in a much deeper, deeper level. Okay? The silence isn't always a good thing. You see silence as being a very negative thing, actually, with Aharon, when Aaron's children died. It says, Vayidom Aharon, and Aharon was silent. Right? The Pasuk said, the, don't, the dead don't praise. There is this idea of silence being bad, but at its core, there's silence, the Mishnah says, is the precursor to wisdom. 
all my days I've grown up among men and among wise people and I haven't found anything better than silence. Silence is the key to all greatness. Why? Because silence opens you up to the possibility of hearing, right? We see this, by the way, with, with, uh, with whom? With Chana and her prayer. She's the one that instituted the Shemon Esrei. Our silent prayer today is because silence, she, because uh, Chana, she, she spoke in her heart. Her, move, her lips moved, but her voice wasn't heard. This idea of her being silent, this idea of her being in a space where she can create this opportunity to absorb the word Shema. Shmi'a means to internalize. It means to gather. It doesn't mean to hear. It's much more than that. So we have this most awesome moment in time where literally the heavens rip themselves open and God reveals himself. And what does he do? He, puts the, he pushes the mute button. Do we create a space for ourselves where um, we could allow God to be heard? Because we're running around all day. Revolvi was often uh, you know, famous for scolding the students on the bus, the city buses in Israel, when he saw them sitting with Walkmans listening to classes. He's like, stop listening to a class. Create a space and time. He's like, why can't you just be alone for a moment? If you want to be able to hear God and his voice, you have to create a space of silence, right? It says that, you know, uh, David Melech says this all over, the, uh, everywhere. We said, Naseh v'nishma. You can't have a place of nishma if you can't hear what's going on around, around you. Okay, the Zohar says that, that silence is the, the, the medium that the sanctuary above and the sanctuary below are made of, the space where there's nothing being said in that beautiful place of vast emptiness, right? The, the, uh, uh, the Gemara and Megillah says, if words are worth a coin, silence is worth two. That was Rosh Hashanah ben Gamaliel. Okay, there's something profound about the silence that we don't fully appreciate. And if you want to be able to be in a place where you can actually hear God, you want to hear God's voice, you have to move yourself sometimes to a place of nothingness. We don't like this. By the way, this is why so many people have, they struggle on Shabbat. What am I going to do on Shabbat? i got no TV. i got no radio. No. It's in those quiet spaces where we create those boundaries, where we allow God into our hearts. We allow Him into our minds. For me, finding God, and this, I'm going to end with this point, because I, I speak about this a lot, and I think it's super important. I, I, I just want to remind everybody. For me, when I look at the universe, I see a world of design. I see a world of perfection. I see a world of just uh, too, much, too many coincidences that I could just call it a coincidence. The, the, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, the Earth and the Moon are perfection. Uh, how life emerged on this planet is perfection. So when I look at the world and I look at the universe, I see design. When I see a designer, you know what else I see? I see a designer. When I see design and designer, I see purpose. If there's purpose in a design, that purpose is purposeless. It's meaningless unless the designer told me what to do with the design. And therefore, Parshat Yitro is the Parsha where the Jewish people are finally being told what the purpose of life is. The purpose of life, my friends, is for you to recognize that you are a spiritual being and not just a body. That you have infinite potential, that you're not an animal, that you could pull yourself and be more than that. That is true, that if any one of you wanted to be a, uh, to have any one of you wanted to have the physique of a silverback gorilla, you totally can, okay? But that's not the purpose of life. The purpose of life is to be a speaker. It says that God created the world with Asara Mamorot. He gave the Torah that's called Aserta Dibrot, Mamar, and Diber. These are the, the cornerstones of our faith. But it doesn't work unless there's a pause. They say Shabbat is a pause in the week. Shabbat is a silence. If you, anyone here plays any uh, instrument, you know that if you keep hitting all the keys at once, you won't hear any music. The music could only exist in the spaces in between the sounds that are coming out. It's the pauses where we hear the music. Shabbat is the pause. Matan Torah is the pause. Shavuot is the Shabbat of the year. That's what we're celebrating in this. That's what we're reading about in this week's parasha. And I think for us in 2024, the message that I want to share with everyone is disconnect so you can connect. Create a space of silence. Go on a walk. Don't take a Walkman with you. Take nothing, no phone. Just walk alone. Be alone in the woods. Look up to the heavens. Speak to God. Create a space of silence so you can let God in. I believe this is how Yitro was able to find God. Someone who was searching and searching and searching didn't find God in all the textbooks of his idolatry. Uh, you know, he found God in those moments of silence when the world was stood silently 
and no one responded to Amalek, when they saw the war break out, all the miracles, and no one said a word, it's in that silence that he was able to find God. My hope and my prayer is that each of us are able to create that silence for ourselves so you and I can rediscover God again. Wishing you all a Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Thank you so much for participating. Looking forward to continuing the conversation next week.